From Starbucks to Capitol Hill. Congress took a major step by allowing some of its own staffers to unionize. Organized labor is having a resurgence. The unionization efforts that we're seeing in this country, probably the strongest that we've seen in several years, if not decades. The increased interest in unionizing is also putting labor laws in the spotlight. The National Labor Relations Board ruled that Amazon unfairly influenced the outcome. They're demanding an end to the punitive cuts to their hours, which they say is an unfair labor practice on the part of Starbucks management. Employers usually start some sort of campaign against a union the moment they find out. That's Ian Colgren, a labor reporter who covers unions. He's here to help us understand what's legal and what isn't when companies in the private sector don't want employees to unionize. Basically, if you're an employer, you can't do really hardball things under labor law like interrogate, surveil, threaten your employees, that sort of thing. What you can legally do is share your thoughts, opinions, insight on what might happen if a union comes to the workplace. Of course, both of those things are kind of in the eye of the beholder, and that's where it can get sort of messy. When it comes to what's permitted and what isn't, language matters. You could say, if you were an employer, I can't tell you with certainty if you have a union what our health plan is going to look like. What you can do is say, hey, I'm going to cut your health benefits if you vote for this union. Even a single tweet may violate the rules. One great example of that is Elon Musk. He's been dinged by the labor board before for tweeting things against the United Auto Workers, which have tried to unionize his plant in California. One practice that is legal, but where the lines can get fuzzy, is the captive audience meeting. It's one of the most effective methods employers have of preventing unionization. So an employer can require employees to sit down for sometimes very long presentations about why they shouldn't unionize, either conducted by them or conducted by an outside firm. All hands on deck anti-union meeting with the general manager of the building and the vice president of HR, you know, basically begging us to vote no. <laughs> Unions claim that the meetings are coercive, used to pressure workers into abandoning their support for unionizing. But labor law allows employers to conduct these meetings because they're held during paid working hours. Employers just can't use them to threaten or intimidate workers. Just how did we get this system? In the early days of unions, it was really the Wild West. There were huge mine workers strikes in Pennsylvania and West Virginia that literally turned into all out war between the employer and the union where people died. It was complete bedlam. Enter the National Labor Relations Act, a law signed by FDR that guaranteed union rights in the private sector. The law made it official U.S. policy to support collective bargaining efforts. It created the National Labor Relations Board. The NLRB runs union elections and referees fights between labor and management. But union advocates say there's one problem. One of the biggest weaknesses of the National Labor Relations Board is that it doesn't really have that many tools to enforce what it orders. In fact, it can levy no punitive damages, only restitutive damages. In other words, while companies must follow the NLRB's orders, they don't get penalized for their misconduct. That's the big criticism on the left of the current powers of the National Labor Relations Board, is that there's no real incentive for employers, especially big companies like Amazon and Google, for example, to not break the law. That doesn't mean the NLRB is powerless. The agency can take employers to court if they don't abide by its decisions. That process can be lengthy, and the NLRB doesn't always win, but it's the only way to enforce its orders. In the end, it may not even be laws or agencies that rein companies in when it comes to unionization. Today's brand-conscious businesses have another force keeping them in check, their reputation. Starbucks got a lot of blowback from its liberal customer base for going very hard at the beginning of, of the union efforts. As a result now, we've seen Apple take a much softer approach to try to convince employees against unionizing. At the same time, we haven't seen that translate yet to increasing the percentage of workers who are members of unions and it sort of remains to be seen whether we are in fact seeing a paradigm shift with unions in this country or whether this will be a momentary thing that fizzles. <laughs>